Greetings, War Thunderers. This is Longshot with you again, with a guide to flying the BF-109E3 in arcade. This was an early war variant of the ML series of the 109s, the difference from the E1 being the replacement of the wing-mounted light machine guns with 20mm MGFF cannon. This change was a response to the British Hurricane and Spitfire with their banks of machine guns and the cannon-armed D520. In War Thunder it's a Tier 2 plane with a current battle ranking of 3.0. To average this to 2.7 you want a similar lineup to what I've shown here, though of course you can supplement it with bombers if you prefer. For me, the BF-110 and MC-202 are essential due to their high altitude performance. Well, I have a lot to cover, so I'll get straight into a flight test. The roll speed first, and it's fairly good. Probably about the same as an early Spitfire. Next, I'll bank the plane for an elevator turn, with smoke on so we can see the size of the circle, which is quite wide, and whether it's able to catch up to the trailing end of the smoke which it cannot. It's also losing speed despite dropping altitude, so I will not be relying on the elevators to turn the plane in combat. Now I'll hit up elevator and rudder together, and you can see how dominant the rudder is. I'll straighten the plane into a rudder turn while holding the elevator to make the plane climb. Now it's turning in a much tighter circle, and doing it much faster as it's catching its smoke trail, and gaining altitude as it does so. If you want to turn this plane sharply, you must use the rudder. Mouse aim alone will not do this for you, so if you haven't mastered the use of the keyboard, now's the time. And up into a vertical climb. I want to see how well it responds to a hammerhead from very low speed. I'll keep climbing till I'm near 100 km an hour and rudder the plane over. And it noses down smoothly and quickly. This plane will be very good at rope -a As I dive, I'm going to test the ailerons again and see if they start to lock up at high speed which they do, starting at 400 km an hour, and you can see how sluggish they are past 500. Using the mouse I'll track sideways and see if the rudder responds, and it does. So its high speed handling isn't great, but it doesn't suffer complete control lockup. Into a zoom climb now, which recovers almost 200, uh, 2 km of altitude before I have to level out. By the way, the plane I'm testing is fully researched. A stock plane will not perform as well. The first thing I'm going to do is, of course, in a real battle, climb. From my testing, the plane climbs best between 260 and 270 km an hour, where it reaches a sustained climb rate in arcade of 41 meters a second using web. And that brings me to a point I wanted to discuss. In my video summarizing the changes to patch 1.43, I noted the reduction in engine power and web across the board in arcade. I queried Gaijin community managers at the time, as it wasn't mentioned explicitly in the patch notes, and I was assured that the change was intentional, and therefore not a bug. Many planes were later found to not only have a reduced wet, but to have lost it entirely, but we all adjusted to the new paradigm, and to the re reduction of UFO flight models in arcade, until a server update on the 2nd of November. According to the patch notes, this fixed a bug in ground forces, and that's all. Except that wasn't all. Super wet boost appeared back in arcade in all its former glory, with no mention in the notes. What on earth are we to think when Gaijin introduced and then reversed major changes while keeping completely silent about them? I'll leave that for you to ponder. Anyway, two web cycles brought me easily to 4,200 meters, and now I'm doing something the 109E3 is fairly good at, and that's hunting bombers. You have the climbing power and speed to run them down, and your weaponry is capable of destroying any bomber you'll meet. Heinkels and Wellingtons die easily as they're both fragile planes with weak guns. You do have to be careful in your approaches though, as even a stray what, a 303 cal bullet can make your engine trail smoke from coolant or oil leaks, which will eventually kill your engine altogether. H6K4s are a different matter, as they have a rear gunner armed with a 20mm cannon. It has a very narrow firing arc, which means you're safe if you approach from above, below and the sides, and spend the least amount of time directly behind. Here I've approached with too little speed, and now I'm danger from the tail gunner, so I break off and drop down to keep out of its view, and gain more momentum to attack again from a better angle. So as I approach for another pass, the H6K4 pilot is awake to the situation, and turns in toward me. This will put me behind him as I overshoot, and allow his gunner to open fire. Notice the orange tracer, that's his cannon. 
so I make sure I'm out of range before I turn and that means I'll, I'll need to chase him down again. Once again I position to approach from the side and begin another attacking run. I should have waited longer and gotten closer before doing so as I see orange tracer, tracer flicking past. But with my opening foot burst I knock the gunner out and now I can safely unload a full magazine into his engines and the fuel tanks in between them. He climbs to evade me which I can counter with a high yo-yo and then return to finish him off with machine guns. I haven't yet discussed the MGFF cannons on the E3. They're probably the slowest rate of fire and muscle velocity of any 20mm cannon in the game. This means you need to get close and fire at angles that maximise time on target. It also means you need a close convergence. I chose 200, 250 metres, though you could go as close as 200. Anyway, enough with bombers. The next most common source of kills will be through boom and zoom attacks, such as this shallow one I'm performing on a climbing I-16. At this point there will doubtless be people telling me that 109s are poor boom and zoomers because of their control lockup at high speed, compared to Focke Wolf 190s, and that the 109s are better as all-round energy fighters, and I'd agree, except that doesn't mean you can't and shouldn't boom and zoom in them. Having flown Tier 2 American fighters, which are often far worse in a dive than this plane, I can really say it's not that bad. In this domination battle I'm going into a high-speed dive at the enemy base to pick up targets of opportunity. On the way down I spotted this biplane cruising on its own and decided he'd be the easiest target, and you should always choose the easiest target in a diving attack. Having positioned myself behind him, I drop down and open fire from just beyond convergence range. I switch on to this 110, not aware that he's already going down, and you can see how difficult it is to make major direction changes at high speed. I then extend away and climb. Ok, so far I've killed two targets that didn't dodge. What about if they're milling around? Beneath me are a bunch of red planes doing just that, dancing with several friendlies and shooting up patrol boats. As this battle's near the end I decide to dive away from altitude and see what I can do down there. Now I've picked out the KO-45 because he's been uh, shooting at patrol boats and is therefore more likely to fly straight than the other reds that are swirling around the friendly P-400. I have no problem tracking this 45 down and getting a good firing solution before extending away. These are quite extreme examples. Usually you wouldn't be looking to dive from this kind of altitude and at these speeds. The point I'm making is that if you can kill targets in the 109 in these kind of high speed attacks, other boom and zooms are easy by comparison. I'm dropping in behind a line of planes on their way to the airfield. I choose the easiest target, zoom and aim carefully at convergence, and then extend away. It's so very simple, and should definitely be part of your repertoire in this plane. So let's look at some more typical diving attacks. In this domination battle, I'm only hanging a short distance above the furball looking for targets to dive on, and then reset back to my perch before trying again. Now my roll speed made it hard but not impossible to attack this KO-45. And then I'll climb and look around, which is oh so important. You only get blindsided when you lose your situational awareness and fail to see an enemy approaching. In this example though I failed to notice my low cannon ammo count, which wasted a golden opportunity to kill the BF-110 on my next diving attack. That's two attacking passes in quick succession. Yet I still have my eyes on the battle as a whole, and I'm not trapped in the furball. I can see that a host of friendlies have rushed over here to kill the 110 and 45, which means the airfield is in enemy hands, and I decide to fly back and look for targets in that direction. And so I begin another diving attack. So far I haven't selected a target, and I'm watching multiple planes to see which one will provide the easiest option. In the end, I settle for the PBY and target his engines and pilot. And then dodge a few near collisions and put some deflection angle shots into the A20 before climbing to reload. I knew from glancing at the minimap that this area had no other enemy planes around. But I could look, I better look around when I get the chance to make sure. Just about reloaded, ready for another run, even though I'm not as high as I'd like to be. 
The battle's just about over now, so it's a matter of scoring whatever kills I can before it ends. And the Nimrod there looks like a very easy target. Slow and straight. And lastly this Spitfire, on whom I'm going to get some very nice sparkles. And the more I played, the more I noticed that happening. Anyway, I'll leave Boom and Zoom aside for now and move on to what often happens when you climb to altitude, even in domination games, and especially when you provocatively fly toward the enemy fighter spawn. Sooner or later someone will climb up to take you on, and because everyone else is busy lawn mowing, you can get to engage in some quite enthralling duels where you can really test and develop your dogfighting skills. I spotted that MC202 climbing up to me, and my first priority is to avoid his guns at all costs, and secondly to maintain my energy advantage. I'm above him and spiral climbing to bleed away his speed, and that results in a great firing opportunity as I catch him at the top of his climb. Luck, however, is not with me this time. I'm only rewarded with a single hit message. I'm not going to follow him down, as who knows where it might lead me, and a diving target is hard to hit. Instead I climb and watch to see what he does, and find him spraying at me from long range. This has become a rope -a I don't want him filling me with holes, so I use rudder to turn it into a climbing spiral and watch for signs he's about to stall. And there his nose drops, so now it's a matter of getting guns on him if I can. I stop climbing and I'm turning with rudder only as I try to bring the nose around. But the moment of stall's passed, and he could easily dive away if he wanted. But he's not done yet. Now I catch him perfectly as he climbs. But once again my guns fail me. I just turn with the rudder and wait for another firing opportunity, which will not be long in coming, as he tries to turn with me in a low energy state. Here we go. And just another hit. And with that, he's had enough, and dives away to safety. Yes, that's disappointing not to get the kill, but taking part in a duel can be its own reward. Letting someone go is like throwing a fish you've caught back into the ocean, but would I prefer my cannons actually worked? Of course I would. As it happened, the same pilot caught me coming out of a zoom climb toward the end of the battle. Our energy states were just about equal, so I led him away from the battle before he went into a low yo-yo to close the range and initiate combat. I broke to the left and started climbing and turning, making myself a difficult target to follow and encouraging him to climb straight up at me, and you can see how much energy he has right now. I didn't evade him entirely, I caught some bullets and took some aileron damage, and now we're in a rolling scissors. I used rudder to get inside his turn, squeeze off a brief burst that damages his rudder, and then climb into an, extend, into an attempted rope -a But I'm soon concerned that I don't have the energy advantage to pull it off, and rather than eating a hail of bullets at the top of my climb, I loop over and dive under him to build up some speed. Back into the rolling scissors we go, which I immediately exit by continuing my turn using full rudder, knowing that with his damaged rudder he can't turn as well, and hence get a snapshot that sets him alight. And that will do it. Of course it's not just other energy fighters that you meet at altitude. Eshaks are commonly seen up here, and if you meet them on equal terms they can eat you for breakfast. The key therefore is to have the energy advantage and never let it go, as an I-16 does stall out quite easily, especially when pushed too hard by an aggressive pilot. This is a simple rudder wing over turn coming out of a climbing spiral, after the opponent stalled and dropped his nose, as you can see there. Didn't quite line him up properly. Just a bit short with my shots. No real damage done, so I have to climb back up to avoid overshooting. I certainly don't want to slow down and try to get on his tail. That would be suicide. I spent a little too long here in a head-on that I didn't think he'd have the energy to hold, and I pull up to avoid taking damage. I did hit his engine though with cannon shells at convergence, but only got another hit message. He is, however, now trailing smoke. holding my climbing spiral to avoid his attempt to prop hang at me again, and now he stalls and drops away, and I'm a little slow to follow. His engine must have died because then he bails out, and I'm not going to be awarded with a kill. 
Your game is broken, Gaijin. Please fix it. Nevertheless, there's an engagement with a dangerous and aggressive turn fighter where a thousand meters of altitude was all I needed to hold him at bay. Here's something else that appears broken right now. A Spitfire Mark IIa is able not only to follow me right up to 7,000 km, uh, 7,000 meters of altitude, it can also perform its full array of maneuvers without threatening to stall. That plane should be wallowing around and barely able to turn at this altitude, and instead I'm eventually forced into a full-on rope -a contest to get it to stall after which I chase it down into the clouds. Watch and see what you think. Even for Arcade, this just feels very wrong to me. By my estimate, it just climbed from 6,000 metres to 7,400 without stalling and it's still able to manoeuvre. I started this engagement with about 1,000 metres of altitude advantage, which I've already lost. So we're pretty much now on level terms. Hence I immediately go into the rope -a dope to try and force the reversal, as I can't turn with a Spitfire if it's going to behave like a Griffin powered Mark 22. Trying to keep out of its line of fire as I climb, and it's hanging with me for a long time, and finally stalls. Now I need to chase it away before it starts another bout of UFO turning, turn fighting. There have been reports on the forums of planes performing far in excess of their proper flight characteristics, and I believe that this is an example right there. Nevertheless, the E3 was up to the challenge, and survived this close encounter of the third kind. And down into the clouds he goes. In this game my problems with the cannons really came to the fore. I'd climbed quite high to gain advantage over two enemy Focke-Wulf 190s and this perfect diving attack on one of them should have been a kill, but I only gained some meaningless critical damage on his tail. Soon thereafter I saw the other 190 dive in a boom and zoom run of its own, and I positioned myself to intercept him as he zoom climbed. This started an enthralling duel where he continually tried to climb up to me while I rudder turned, making myself a tough target while getting repeated firing opportunities at convergence range, none of which did any real damage. His speed seems quite low, so I'm diving into attack, hoping to catch him while he's slow. I fire a really nice stream of shells that should have set him alight or ripped off a wing or killed his pilot, but that did nothing at all. So back into a climb I go to recover my altitude advantage and try again. You can really see the difference in engine power here. The E3 is right on the limit of its capacity at 6,000 metres and higher, and the 190 is already started, uh, starting to threaten me in its climbs, despite nearly stalling 1,500 metres below me just a little while ago. But he hasn't taken away my advantage just yet. Apart from holding the upper hand energy wise, the 109 has a huge advantage in the power of its rudder. The 190s is quite weak as are its elevators. It has no answer for the tight turns I make as I manoeuvre again to get guns on him as he climbs. Now we're into a rolling scissors and it's essential I finish him off. But more perfect shots at convergence are only capable of a critical hit. It's not that the 190 is unusually strong. It's the cannons on this plane that are letting me down right now. 
as I pass over him I hear his engine note drop and I know that he's trying to get me to overshoot, which I'm not buying into. I don't have the energy to high yo-yo above him, so I'm just going into a yet another rudder turn. Because he tried the overshoot trick, the one night he's lost all his speed now, and should be a sitting duck if I get guns on him again. Which I do as he makes one last attempt to climb, and I hit his full profile at convergence, and I'm going to be rewarded with another meaningless hit. After this, he gives up the fight and dives away. The 109 has once again held its own inner duel against a powerful plane, but its guns are really letting it down. So after this I looked at the ammo belts. I decided to try stealth, which has the greatest proportion of high explosive, as my theory was that HE rounds are currently broken for this type of cannon. I flew a few rounds with this belt and here's the highlights from one of them. So many sparkles and so little damage. In the end of this battle I had 25 hits, 2 criticals and 2 kills, from fires set by machine guns while the cannons were reloaded. HE shells are indeed broken, for me at least. So instead I tried the tracer belt, which has no high explosive at all, just incendiary tracers and fragmentation, fragmentation incendiary tracers, and that's the first plane I targeted with this belt, and I kept on getting kill after kill with single attacking passes, which convinced me to stick with this belt. So now that's out of the way, the last battle I'll show you illustrates the importance of holding the high altitude advantage. As I climbed I saw a glimpse of an enemy I-16 that had also climbed, so I decided to keep gaining altitude up past 5,000 metres as I turned toward the combat zone. And there he is. A quick check of the stats shows me that he's carrying rockets, so I must avoid head-ons. Not that I'd risk it against his buzz or machine guns anyway. Engaging with the altitude advantage is now all important, so while he rocketed a PBY, I climbed some more. Because I'd taken the trouble to gain this extra height, I was holding all the cards when he turned to engage me. And here he comes. I'm still climbing, though now at a faster speed, as I'll need that for manoeuvring. He does what many Ishak pilots do, climbing up from underneath to prop hang and spray me with bullets. Even despite my precautions I'm forced into a spiral climb to keep him at bay. I hammer it over and time it perfectly as his nose drops at the same moment. Only a critical, but Ishaks can be quite tough to kill sometimes. I intend to climb again, but I see him stalling as he tries to climb and turn right in front of me. Which is a gift I can't refuse. And that set me free to hunt down the squadron of enemy bombers, either killing them or driving them through the clouds, and then took out another one over their airfield. After which things became a little quiet, so I decided to fly smoke and shallow dive at high speed directly toward their fighter spawn. So I'd be the first plane they'd see when they dropped into the game. As it happened, the I-16 pilot has just spawned into a new one and appears to have taken the bait. So up I go into a zoom climb, inviting him to come on up and dance. This is quite a provocative way of getting people's attention, but it does seem to work well. If there's two of you working together, you can take turns, diving and baiting climbers, with the second player dropping in to pick up the kills. Even flying solo though it works, and it's very useful in battles where no one seems to want to climb. He lost his speed about 4,000, uh, 1,400 metres below me and seems undecided what to do next. And then he started another climb, so I'm diving down to medium, but I've attacked a little too quickly as he has, has enough speed to level out and dodge away. So back up to altitude I go, and sure enough he will helicopter after me. I'm surprised that he's landing hits at long range, so I'm going to hammer head over, and this time he'll be too slow to escape. Those long range shots of his however did do damage, even though it wasn't reported in the game or shown on the damage indicator. I'm now trailing a thin white stream of smoke, 
which is the coolant leaking out of my engine, and eventually I'm going to lose my engine altogether. Okay, he's back in the lag. He seems to be following the logic of spawning your most powerful planes last, on the premise that you'll lose the early planes anyway, and you'll need the good ones at the end of the battle. Needless to say, I take the opposite approach, as I don't expect to lose my planes at all. This time I'm able to get the kill with a simple boom and zoom, with his attempted split S not enough to evade the attack, as he performed it a little too late. By the way, I want to make it clear that I mean no disrespect at all towards this pilot. He tried to do the right thing at the start by securing altitude and killing bombers, and now he's the only player on his team trying to contest altitude over their airfield. Don't forget that above me are several blue bombers pounding their bases, and I am in the way, keeping them safe from attack. Kringer is doing his best to take me on when he could be just farming easy furball kills, and for that I applaud him. Anyway, this time he's flown away behind his spawn probably hoping to lose me behind that cloud. He's in a Yak-1, a plane every bit as good as the BF-109E3, probably better in some respects, despite being ranked down at 2.0, where it certainly does not belong. It's essential I prevent him from reaching my altitude and engaging on equal terms. This guy is a fast learner, he's now watching me very closely, and he's reluctant to climb if there's any chance I can dive and intercept him and this is turning into a real cat and mouse game. I decide to shake things up by making a false dive to see how he responds. My rate of gain on him slows down which indicates that he's diving and then I pull up into a zoom climb as soon as I see that. I hit web in order to regain all my altitude back and now both oil and water are starting to overheat. It's the first sign that my engine may be on the way out. He followed my Imo zoom climb, which shows how closely I'm being watched, so I turn straight over into another diving attack, thinking his energy state must be fairly low. He goes into a split S earlier this time, and I have to abort and climb once again, which means more web abuse of my overheating engine. And you can see he was following me once more. At the top of the climb, the damage indicator pops up with a pink engine. The writing's on the wall now. I need the kill quickly, else I'll be coasting back to base with a dead engine and helpless to stop him from picking me off. The first thing I do is deactivate the smoke, as it's probably helping him to track my position through the clouds. Once again though, I'm stalking him from 1500 metres above, waiting for his next move, as my engine turns a darker shade of pink. Finally he's climbing. There's no doubt about it as the gap between us is decreasing even though I'm gaining altitude myself. I circle around to let him bleed off his energy, and then I will try for a last diving attack. If this doesn't work I'll probably use the speed to extend straight towards my base. He creeps closer again as he climbs some more, and then I pull the trigger and dive in, my engine turning black on the way down. Now it's hard avoiding people when all you can see are their icon through the cloud, and this time his split S wasn't enough to save him. And thank goodness I was using the tracer belt, which got me the kill. And with that he's lost his last plane, and I'm finally able to head back for repairs. One very last example I want to show you. I've been making a pest of myself for a while up here at altitude in this battle, and then decide to boom and zoom a hurricane. And while looking for more targets at lower altitude, I find myself in a head-on with a P-40 that I've taken my eye off. I avoided him with a snap roll, then used my climbing advantage to drag him higher and keep him in a low energy state, eventually using the 109's powerful rudder to get position for a kill. And while all that's playing out, I should summarise. The 109E3 is a great climber, and you need to use that secure to secure and keep an altitude advantage whenever possible hunt bombers and make boom and zoom attacks, these are your staple source of easy kills. When forced into a dogfight at altitude, avoid head-ons, use your energy advantage to keep enemies at arm's length, and use the rudder to turn the plane. Do not bank and yank on the elevators, it will not work out for you. Fire only at or near convergence distance, which should be close, 
and choose the most effective belt on the Canon. For me it's traces, but your mileage may vary. When I started recording footage for this video I'd only flown the plane seven times for four deaths and four kills. Hardly impressive. It took very little time to research all the modules and bear in mind I'm not paying for premium. Most important are the engine modifications. Right now I've scored another 43 kills at the cost of one death from another 17 flyouts. That's only two and a half kills per flight, which still isn't bad considering the amount of trouble I had with unreliable ammunition. I'm only posting my stats to show that the methods I've demonstrated here are indeed effective and to encourage you to give them a try. I must say that I've been pleasantly surprised by this plane. Also these tactics are equally applicable to the Yaks as they are also strong climbers with good rudders. Although the elevators are better than 109s so they have more options available to them in a dogfight. By the way this plane also carries bombs which can be used to kill tanks in domination games as it's a precise dive bomber. In the meantime this P-40 is proving tough to kill as they often do. It's one of the few American fighters in this game to have a realistic damage model. In real life it was a strongly built plane that could absorb a lot of punishment and it's the same in War Thunder 2. I make a bit of a mistake here accidentally crossing its path and giving him a chance to light me up but fortunately for me he chose not to fire. That will be the last chance he gets as now he's out of speed and out of options. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Until the next one, I'll see you in the skies.